If you've been paying attention to upcoming video game releases, you know that a 2003 cartoon game is receiving the full remake from the ground up treatment. Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated is slated to release this year on all current generation platforms and PC. You might be asking yourself, why? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm SM Loader, here to guide you through the full story of how speedrunning Battle for Bikini Bottom evolved from a humble passion into a movement that revived the forgotten cult classic. Our story of ingenuity, resilience, camaraderie, and personal growth will be covered in four parts. So without further ado, let's start from the very beginning. The SpongeBob SquarePants property has collectively sold over 20 million video game copies, estimated to be tied with the likes of the Spyro, Castlevania, Mass Effect, and SimCity franchises. Despite the SpongeBob video game franchise's eventual success, its beginnings, especially in the realm of 3D games, were undeniably shaky. In 2002, SpongeBob SquarePants Revenge of the Flying Dutchman was released for the PlayStation 2 and GameCube, making it the first entry in SpongeBob's 3D lineup. And this game was not initially received as a treasure. What is that? What the f is that? That's it? What a rip! <laughs> SpongeBob betrayed us! Rent. Buy or burn. Burn! Burn, I say! Burn! <clears throat> This game should not be played. Even true SpongeBob fans should steer clear of this overrated game. Like me, I still love SpongeBob as a whole, but this piece of trash is inexcusable and embarrassing to the SpongeBob name. Quote taken from user Celebiz, GameFAQs Reviews. It was looking like the SpongeBob franchise would fall victim to the same fate that other cartoon video games had suffered being rushed cash grabs designed only to capitalize on children's attachments to the cartoons they were based on. That is, until the small development company Heavy Iron Studios got on the case in 2003. Up until this point, Heavy Iron's biggest success was Scooby-Doo Night of 100 Frights in 2002. It was a good start, but their next title would become their biggest success, and with time, the most impactful licensed game of the early 2000s. SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom A 3D platformer and adventure game with a simple plot. Plankton creates an army of robots to procure the Krabby Patty secret formula, and they run amok. You, as SpongeBob, and his best friends Patrick and Sandy, must foil Plankton's scheme. Golden spatulas are collected and used to unlock new areas inspired by episodes from the cartoon. The game, despite receiving mixed reviews upon release, became a huge success and set the SpongeBob video game franchise ablaze. The game sold 3.22 million copies worldwide across all consoles, with the PlayStation 2 version contributing more than half of those sales at 1.7 million. So if you grew up with a GameCube or Xbox, this might be why you haven't heard of Battle for Bikini Bottom. But if you grew up with a PlayStation 2, this game was essential. And still, the game was re-released as a platinum or greatest hit on all three of its original consoles. It even made the short backward compatibility list on the Xbox 360. But if the game was so popular back in the good old days, why did the passage of time treat it so harshly? After the theatrical release of the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, the original writers of the show, including its creator Steven Hillenburg, traded places with a new team which would steer the franchise into a direction targeted for younger children as opposed to general audiences. For those growing up in the early 2000s, the show was aiming younger while they were growing older. Maybe SpongeBob games weren't so appealing to them anymore. So with that, Battle for Bikini Bottom was left behind. And with the show's decline in reputation among older audiences, so too came a decline in optimism toward the game's acclaim. Later into the 2000s, a popular YouTube format called Let's Playing emerged. Maybe you've heard of it. But during this time, Battle for Bikini Bottom was mostly forgotten, or not really given a chance by those who rediscovered it. So why did people want us to play this? I don't know, dude. This I, is not interesting. I don't think we've actually gotten to the game yet. Maybe they assumed the worst from an early 2000s game based on a show now entirely targeted at young children. The game seemingly lost its reputation, and those who could uphold it were nowhere to be found. The game's fans, where were they? 
Well, the fandom still existed, but it was scattered, ununified. Unlike those of other popular games from its era, no serious efforts to keep the game alive and interesting gained any traction. It seemed Battle for Bikini Bottom had missed the golden opportunity of riding the internet's rapid growth during the early 2000s. But under the surface, something was building. Slowly at first, but in due time, it would gain traction. After all, the goal was to go fast. Speedrunning. In its purest form, completing a video game as quickly as possible. Before the days of mainstream retro capture and video uploading, speedrunners posted their records on an online forum called Speed Demos Archive. At this time, video recordings of full runs were uncommon, especially for less popular games. Most games didn't even have an established community to play them. Naturally, some users were desperate for others to beat their own childhood favorites as quickly as possible. In 2006, a user named Groudon199 posted a thread titled Spongebob Squarepants Battle for Bikini Bottom, asking, Would someone like to try this speedrun? It would be getting 75 golden spatulas, then beating the final boss. Maybe someone could do a 100% run if it isn't too long. Mm, the game's kind of long, so multi-segmented runs will do. <laughs> These cries for attention were usually met with contempt from more established members of the speedrunning community. You! Requesting runs around here rarely gets anywhere. Since you seem to have enough interest in a run to post a topic, why not you? And so, he didn't. For four years, Battle for Bikini Bottom speedrunning, despite its <clears throat> uh, robust beginnings, went completely dark. Until July 29th, 2010, when user KT1JDDD created another thread on SDA, discussing his plans to speedrun Battle for Bikini Bottom, hoping to get under three hours on his first attempt. And his plans were just as complex as his username. From this point onward, let's just refer to him as KT. And KT would become the first to complete a Battle for Bikini Bottom any percent speedrun. For those not familiar with speedrunning, an any percent speedrun requires the player to beat the game from start to finish as quickly as possible, with no in-game restrictions other than cheating, of course. Battle for Bikini Bottom is an open-world game, so figuring out the path from start to finish can be tricky. Let's discuss how the game actually plays to figure this out. The game features three main types of collectibles. The fabulous golden spatula, the illustrious shiny object, and the smelly sock. Golden spatulas are the main mode of progression throughout the game, unlocking new areas and challenges as they are collected. Think of them like Super Mario 64's stars, except you need 75 to beat the game instead of just 70. Shiny objects are the currency of Battle for Bikini Bottom. They are paid throughout levels to access new areas or to Mr. Krabs for some more spatulas. Socks are hidden around levels similarly to spatulas and their sole purpose is to be traded with Patrick for more spatulas. Think of these like Super Mario Sunshine's blue coins. Once the player has collected 15 golden spatulas from the start of the game, they may challenge the first major boss, Robo Sandy, after which SpongeBob is awarded with the Bubble Bowl power-up. Defeating Robo Sandy also unlocks the second area of the hub world where your Bubble Bowl skills will be tested in three new worlds. Collect 40 spatulas throughout the first two hub areas to challenge the second boss fight, Robo Patrick, which awards SpongeBob with the Cruise Bubble power-up, as well as access to the third hub area. Finally, use both of your unlocked abilities in all nine of the worlds to reach the 75 golden spatulas required to unlock the final boss fight inside the Chum Bucket Lab and finish the game. As previously mentioned, this game is open world, so between leaving SpongeBob's pineapple and entering the Chum Bucket Lab, any spatula throughout the game can be used to meet the requirement of 75. So KT, in his endeavor to complete the first Battle for Bikini Bottom speedrun, was faced with the challenge of figuring out which combinations of spatulas, socks, and shiny objects were the fastest for reaching the end of the game and defeating Robo SpongeBob. You might be thinking that this was a huge task for one person to figure out alone, especially with no backbone of speedrun knowledge to rely on. And in short, <laughs> yes it was. Despite the game's open world design, most of the levels are blocked by barricades, out of bounds detection, and gates that require golden spatulas to enter. Only one could be accessed at the start of the run, Jellyfish Fields. But KT had a plan, or rather, a speedrun route. In the context of Battle for Bikini Bottom, this refers to the order in which the runner collects objectives with intent to reach the final goal. 
Unfortunately, KT's exact route was never posted and no footage exists for his run. However, we do know, based on his post, which spatulas, how many socks, and how many shiny objects he collected to complete the run in under three hours. Only the order of segments and exact socks collected are up to speculation. What's up everyone, it's Shift here with a shovel and pick. Today we're going to excavate the deep history of BFPB and speculate what the first speedrun of this game might have looked like based on this fossil of a thread. After examining KT's post from 2010 and researching which strategies were known at the time, here's my take on how KT beat the game in under 3 hours. KT started by collecting 50 shiny objects in Spongebob's pineapple to enter the closet and collect the first golden spatula. After leaving, he collected two more spatulas in Bikini Bottom and entered Jellyfish Fields. He made sure to collect socks and combo tikis for shiny object bonuses along the way. KT made clear in his post that plenty of combos are required to have enough shiny objects for passing the bridge in Jellyfish Fields and paying for the other expensive clams along the way. Throughout Jellyfish Fields, he collected eight spatulas and... Well, he didn't specify which socks he collected due to some... laziness and secrecy. Oh, okay. But we do know that throughout the game, he collected 40. And since Jellyfish Fields has 14 socks hidden throughout the world, it's likely that many of them were collected in there. Leaving downtown, KT would have collected a total of 16 golden spatulas and a bunch of socks. KT specified that new research, I mean I got smarter, has allowed me to get the Bubble Bowl before Goo Lagoon which will help me get more shiny objects. Well, after my own research, I think I've cracked the code on KT's super secret strats. Because KT already had 16 spatulas and only 15 are required to challenge the first boss, he did this first and then entered Goo Lagoon afterward. While collecting all eight golden spatulas in Goo Lagoon, he used the sandcastle tikis to grind for shiny objects necessary for the rest of the run. Destroying the hammer bot on the way up, igniting the large stack, and bowling a thunder tiki off the bridge would maximize the payout, right before jumping into the moat and drowning to reset the tikis and go again. The extra tikis on the bridge must be why KT waited until after getting the bubble bowl to enter Goo Lagoon. After finishing Goo Lagoon, KT took care of the second hub area spatulas, collecting all from Rock Bottom, Sand Mountain, and the Mermelair. Except for the one from the Rolling Ballroom challenge. That damn Rolling Ballroom. With the second hub area finished, he fought the second boss to unlock the second power-up, the Cruise Bubble. Now we enter the third and final chapter, containing the Kelp Forest, Spongebob's Dream, and the Flying Dutchman's Graveyard. KT claims to have collected three spatulas from the Kelp Forest, which likely included the one from the first zone, then the two from the swamp. KT most likely figured out that stacking two tikis next to this cliff can actually skip the entire tiki roundup puzzle. And after doing so, KT went down in the swamps as Patrick to collect the spatula in the cage. KT's dream segment excluded one spatula from Sandy's dream. Rather than collecting the spatula at the end of the long slide segment, he collected the one awarded for fighting the robots at the Alamo. Though it was pretty expensive, fighting the robots and getting some of those juicy combos he talked about earlier would have helped make up some of those shiny objects. KT also decided to exclude the spatula in Squidward's dream. With all that crazy platforming, he had to go with something easier. And in the Flying Dutchman's graveyard... Well, it looks like he didn't even enter the graveyard in his run. Perhaps the clams are just too expensive? Or maybe those wall jumps were just too crazy. Or maybe he was just... too lazy. I... I don't know. But the numbers do check out. 75 spatulas without the graveyard. KT's brain was so big that he didn't even need the graveyard to beat the game in under 3 hours. Truly remarkable. I should give KT more credit for his gaming skills, however. After collecting 75 spatulas, he still had to go through the gauntlet of Robo Spongebob Part 2, with no checkpoints or means to restore health. The player must complete a series of challenges consecutively to neutralize the giant robot's brain and finish the game. The speedrun officially ends when all three of the fuses inside the robot's brain are destroyed. KT's route may have been rough around the edges to say the least, but the development of a speedrun has to start somewhere, in order to begin the process of unlocking the game's full potential. But how much potential does speedrunning this game actually have? Despite its undeniably tight controls, it seemed like the level progression at this point was pretty linear, having little freedom to choose world order due to spatula requirements, grinding currency to purchase expensive tolls everywhere, being forced to complete extremely long, tedious puzzles. Was it all worth it? And with such little attention given to the forgotten title, would its potential ever be realized? Well, some beacons of hope would soon arrive. 
Over one year after the creation of KT's thread on August 18th, 2011, a user named Yoshi Master replied saying that he got a run that was around 2 hours and 30 minutes long, using a new, groundbreaking glitch. He posted a video containing a maneuver on the Jellyfish Fields taxi pad which resulted in an odd glitch that appeared to allow Spongebob to go out of bounds without being stopped. This glitch, which later became known as hand disabling, is performed by leaving a zone with the hand on screen. Hand disabling prevents Spongebob from voiding out while falling into any designated out-of-bounds area. Only a few days later, Yoshi Master posted a new video titled Quick Spatulas Via Out-of-Bounds Glitch. By disabling the hand, Yoshi Master could jump into the out-of-bounds areas at the start of Jellyfish Fields to collect a golden spatula awarded for completing a challenge accessible later, that being Kawabungi. The game would usually prevent the player from jumping into this ditch to collect the spatula before accessing the challenge, but with Yoshi Master's new glitch, he could collect the spatula without being stopped. But the big time save from this has yet to be discussed. Surprisingly, many casual players never figured out that you can pause the game and select any of the tasks you've received in the menu to instantly warp between them. Typically, the pause menu task warps are unlocked after accepting the tasks from various characters, presumably so you can come back to do them later. For the speedrun, however, Yoshi Master found a way to warp to these tasks before accepting them. By collecting a spatula before its task is accepted, the task warp location is unlocked without talking to anyone. For instance, Gary in Jellyfish Fields, who tells you there's a spatula under the bungee hook. After collecting the Kawabungi spatula from Out of Bounds, Yoshi Master could use the warp menu exploit so he didn't have to go through any of the gameplay between the starting area of Jellyfish Fields and Gary's dialogue, which would normally be where he would unlock the task. This huge skip also cut out the need for 125 shiny objects to complete the bridge at the beginning of the level. Already, KT's original route was being improved upon significantly. But Yoshi Master's next find would really throw a wrench into what KT thought was the fastest way to complete the game. Yoshi Master would prove that using the graveyard was not only worthwhile, but also very fast. His next major skip found through abusing menu warps and hand disabling was in the second zone of the graveyard, where he walked out of bounds to collect the spatula in the shipwreck bungee ditch similar to how he did for Kawabungi in Jellyfish Fields. Yoshi Master could not only warp to shipwreck bungee after this, effectively skipping the majority of the zone, but could also avoid paying 2,700 shiny objects for the clam intended to drop the bungee hook for collecting the spatula. The implications were huge. Meanwhile, KT had claimed another world record of 2 hours and 37 minutes on October 24th, 2011, still with no video available. On October 23rd of 2011, KT claimed he'd achieved a sub-230 without using Yoshi Master's new discoveries and knew that with implementation, they would make his run hell of fast. But something wasn't quite adding up. When he finally found means of capturing his PlayStation 2's gameplay, KT claimed he recorded a full run and was, um, editing out the loading screens to avoid sacrificing too much valuable time. Apparently, KT edited out so many loading screens, he saved an entire day. While KT went back to the future, a second community was developing their own strategies on a taskvideos.org forum, similarly structured to SDA, but for tool-assisted speedrunning. On April 4th, 2011, user JLun2 described a skip for phase one of Robo SpongeBob, which caused the first phase to end for absolutely no reason when SpongeBob is launched high enough. It was later realized through use of action replay moon jump codes that the developers had left a cutscene trigger far above the fight's spawn point and colliding with it caused the phase to immediately end. This was likely added as a debug tool during development and the task videos community had uncovered it through the use of external tools. This kind of resourcefulness would help speed up the optimization process when combined with the efforts of the SDA community. Throughout 2011, user CoolKirby relayed information found on the SDA thread to the users on the task videos thread, updating them on developing strategies such as Yoshi Master's hand disable. They discussed possible uses including some major skips on the kelp vine slide, agreeably the toughest time trial in the game. With users aware of both threads, a collision course was imminent. But it would take the emergence of two great minds to crack the game wide open and unify an effort to progress the speedrun. On February 22nd, 2012, a user named Rody B. Tomman from the United States posted a groundbreaking application of the hand disable glitch on the Battle for Bikini Bottom SDA thread. This user would later become known as Cole625. 
Cole's new trick utilized Yoshi Master's Kawabungi skip, warping back to Bikini Bottom after collecting the spatula and causing the Saving Game logo to stay on screen. With this state active, Cole could walk onto Out of Bounds Skill Sand without deactivating the hand glitch found by Yoshi Master. With the Saving Game logo on screen, the hand won't be summoned as it cannot interrupt the game being saved. With this strategy, Cole could walk far out of bounds, around the invisible barriers bordering the main hub world, and reach the second area of the hub previously only unlockable by defeating the first boss. Cole had successfully broken the sequence of in-game events by gaining access to later levels before completing the earlier ones. This is what we'll refer to as a sequence break. A sequence break differs from a skip in that it deviates from the intended order of objectives without removing the objectives from the sequence entirely. A skip simply cuts out gameplay in a way to where that gameplay is no longer required. So despite Cole's groundbreaking discovery, he had not simply skipped a third of the game, he had only discovered how to access more levels at an earlier time. The next day, Cole posted a video explaining how to sequence break from the second hub area to the third hub area, without defeating Robopatrick. By spacing two jumps and a spin to stall air momentum from the police station, Cole jumped over the barrier guarding the third hub area and effectively gained access to all nine levels without fighting the first two major bosses. However, there still were some limitations to these discoveries. So, as we mentioned before, Battle for Bikini Bottom has three explorable worlds accessible in each of the three hub areas, totaling nine. The limitation of Cole's discovery comes from spatula unlock requirements. There's only one world in each of the three hub areas that is free from a spatula requirement to enter. In the first area, this is Jellyfish Fields, in the second, the Mermelayer, and in the third, Spongebob's Dream. So despite having access to all nine of the worlds, Cole could only enter three of them with his current spatula count. But that's not all. Without having defeated the bosses to unlock the Bubble Bull or Cruise Bubble, Cole was... powerless. The Mermelayer was not viable to play early, due to a huge gap preventing the player from entering its main chamber, only accessible by bowling a paddle wheel with... the Bubble Bull. And as for reaching the third hub world, the Bubble Bull was also required to unlock a trampoline for bouncing on top of the police station. Without being able to reach the top of the police station, Cole could not jump over the barrier to the third hub world. This was extremely unfortunate, for if Cole were able to reach Spongebob's dream, there are spatulas in that level he could obtain early, with neither the Bubble Bull nor the Cruise Bubble. The challenge was now figuring out how to get on top of the police station without the Bubble Bull. It seemed progress had halted. That is, until two months later. On May 24th, 2012, Cole posted several videos containing new strategies, which actually included the Robo Sponge Skip found by Jaylun2, and also the long-awaited police station climb. That's right, Cole figured out how to reach the top of the police station by bouncing between the hub barrier and the police station walls repeatedly. This discovery truly established Cole as an abstract thinker and a problem solver. His progress further attracted the attention of the task videos community surrounding the game, which had been focusing on skipping the 75 spatula lock on the Chum Bucket Lab. It seemed all this time while Cole was working on sequence breaking and reorganizing spatulas, the task community was trying to straight up skip the entire game. But as 2012 carried on, it became clear that Cole's approach was far more practical. As the year came to a close, lab door skip had never been found. At this point, Cole's progress and KT's time heist encouraged some members of the task videos thread to migrate to the SDA thread. It's personal, along with the help of her friend Pitor Flaxandrosis, would enter the SDA thread with an already completed any percent run of 215.07. At this time, it was the fastest run claimed to have been performed. They had routed the run together and recorded it in a single segment, becoming the first official world record for the game. It's personal and Pitor Flaxandrosis would later become known as Hazel and Nathan respectively. These Canadian speedrunners had been routing and hunting for strategies together in person, and believed their route could go as low as 2 hours and 7 minutes. This run had also been performed on the GameCube version of the game, rather than the PlayStation 2 version. Though not intentionally chosen, the GameCube version saved quite a bit of time over the PlayStation 2 due to faster loading times between zones. This became the first version change in the speedrun's development. On New Year's Eve in 2012, Hazel and Nathan discovered a route that would save multiple minutes by sequence breaking the kelp forest and completing it in reverse order. This can be done by climbing out of bounds at the start of the first zone and walking along the level barrier to reach the exit of the final zone. This spawns the player at the end of the final zone where a golden spatula can be collected and a teleport box can be found close by. Let's take a minute to explain why this was such a big deal. Teleport boxes can be found throughout most zones in BFBB, which allow the player to jump between them if both are opened. 
but as an accessibility feature, some levels allow the player to open the box near their beginning automatically by only opening the one at the end. This allows the player to warp back to the beginning of a level even if they forgot to open the box at the start, making backtracking much less frustrating. But the developers of course did not foresee Hazel and Nathan's new Kelp Forest Backward trick, which allowed them to abuse this accessibility mechanic to jump from the end of the level to the beginning of the level, effectively skipping the entire Kelp Vine slide. Abusing teleport boxes and the placement of Mermaid Man's time challenge trigger could be used to instantly win what many considered the hardest time challenge in the game as well. After collecting two spatulas from the kelp vines, Hazel and Nathan could then enter the kelp caves through its exit, collecting the golden spatula at the end of the level and utilizing Yoshi Master's warp abuse strat to select the kelp caves without having unlocked the task. This placed them at the beginning of the kelp caves where they could again enter the next level through its exit. Now they were in the kelp swamps, placed right in front of the spatula awarded for the Tiki Roundup puzzle. This was not only a huge improvement over KT's presumed tiki stacking strategy, but also allowed collecting six spatulas in the kelp forest at lightning speed, rather than only three at a much slower pace. With Cole, Hazel, and Nathan all taking the sequence break approach, Battle for Bikini Bottom's any percent run would start to optimize rapidly. On New Year's Day, Hazel posted the new kelp forest route on the SDA thread. Cole was inactive on the thread since the police station discovery, but had been posting plenty of new finds on his YouTube channel since then. Combining her knowledge with Cole's, Hazel achieved her first world record in Battle for Bikini Bottom Any%, percent, 1 hour 51 minutes and 45 seconds. Though this run's video no longer exists, we do know which new strategies were included. Cole's major skips for the first zone of Jellyfish Fields and reaching the Rock Bottom Museum without finding Sandy allowed Hazel to skip many convoluted tutorials and puzzles. Precise jump spacing allows the player to reach the villain containment system to fight Prawn without shutting down the security system, but despite skipping to the end of the Mermelayer with this trick, Hazel still needed to collect the other golden spatulas throughout this world. This is where Cole's security tunnel skip would save another chunk of time. By scaling solid objects around the security tunnel, the player can skip the first section of the blinking tile tunnels. Then, damage boosting off the floating turrets on level 2 can actually be used to boost onto level 3. Cole also found a cutscene skip before Jellyfish Caves, along with another tight jump that would save lots of time climbing up to Spork Mountain later. His downtown route was also quite impressive for the time. The level was truly a playground for big sequence breaks and wacky strats. A new trick called Spongeball Storage potentially had use here, which allows the player to pick up and store a Spongeball with a variety of states. The player can then transform whenever they please to release any of the desired effects. The strategy would eventually see use in Rock Bottom, where it would be used to store a trampoline bounce for collecting the Swing Along spatula previously only accessible while playing as Sandy. A few days after Hazel posted her official world record showcasing these strategies, Cole returned to the SDA thread posting a new skip for collecting the Tower Bungee spatula without paying for it. By climbing the flags linking the tent to this tower, Cole climbed to the top and landed a precise jump sequence to grab the wooden planks at the top of the tower. This saved 2200 shiny objects because he no longer had to pay the clam to drop the trampoline intended for reaching the top of the tower. With this skip along with the new stalagmite platforming route used to clear the sea caves, Goo Lagoon was coming along quite nicely. At this point, the routes for Jellyfish Fields, Downtown, and Goo Lagoon were fast enough to obtain the 15 spatulas required to challenge Robo Sandy without using Cole's hub area sequence breaks. Completing the first three worlds immediately was now far more effective, as it didn't waste over a minute walking out of bounds. And with strategies for later worlds already in place, the game plan to reach 75 spatulas was now clearer than ever before. With a solidified route for Battle for Bikini Bottom Any% percent, the group began organizing speedrun races on speedrunslive.com, otherwise known as SRL. SRL is a site designed to host speedrun races and rank players based on their wins and losses. The first race took place on January 4th, 2013, during which Cole set a new world record of 149.51. Nine days later, Hazel completed a race in 145.29, another new world record. And four days after that, Cole took the world record back again with a 142.52, beating her in a race by two minutes. This would mark the beginning of a friendly rivalry between the two while collaborating on their passion project. Later that month on January 30th, a close race occurred between Hazel and Cole, where they both achieved the first sub-140s, but Hazel edged out Cole by 32 seconds with a 138.10. A similar race occurred later the same day, where Cole took the world record back with a 134.58, Hazel still close behind. It seemed either player could beat the world record in any race at any time. 
This competition inspired others to search for strategies to drive the time down even further. It seemed a small community surrounding Battle for Bikini Bottom was starting to unify and take form. For over a week after the 134, Battle for Bikini Bottom on SRL went quiet. Up until this point, it was quite active with frequent sessions and world records. Then, to break the silence on February 10th, 2013, Cole uploaded an astonishing time of 127.31 to his YouTube channel. He had achieved the first sub-130 and left Hazel's personal best in the dust. At this point, Cole had solidified himself as the fastest Battle for Bikini Bottom speedrunner. Aside from improvements in movement and consistency, Cole's run introduced new cutting-edge strategies that further showcased the collective creativity amongst himself, Hazel, Nathan, and the few others in their small community. Here's what a speedrun of Battle for Bikini Bottom 80% now looks like. Cole's 127 gained a lot of traction on YouTube, inspiring new players to join races, search for strategies, and contribute to the community. One user inspired by the run named Cooper Crisp created a knowledge base containing all strategies known for speedrunning Battle for Bikini Bottom up until that point. Although long since outdated, that knowledge base is in the description if you'd like to check it out. With a small community formed, a fully recorded any percent run gaining traction, and world record competition, many fans who had forgotten about Battle for Bikini Bottom would rediscover the game and watch these exciting developments from the sidelines. Cole's and Hazel's Twitch channels would start averaging 20 to 50 viewers per livestream, where they'd attempt to beat the game as quickly as possible. The small community dedicated to progressing one of their favorite games continued to gain traction. After the first sub-130 was achieved, the Battle for Bikini Bottom community knew the race to sub-120 was on. Unlike the early days of laziness and secrecy, runners enthusiastically shared strats and knowledge to progress the run. All information known was accessible, so it was up to the runner's execution to best their rivals. A fair game of friendly competition. Cole and Hazel continued streaming speedrun attempts on Twitch, where dozens would watch patiently as they tried to lower the game below an hour and 20 minutes. On March 7, 2013, Cole finished a run in 126.49, but its video evidence has since been lost to time. The next world record that we do have video of would take place on March 9th during another one of Cole's Twitch streams, barely missing the next minute threshold. Despite being so close to 124, Cole presumably took an extended break from speedrunning BFBB after this run. But come summer, Cole and Hazel would begin organizing races again, and together they'd progress the game while new runners joined the fray. Cole's world record dominance would finally end on August 10th, when Hazel would complete a run of BFBB any percent in 122.24. And with several new runners joining the community, it was only a matter of time before their combined efforts would generate new strategies. 
SRL races would continue until the summer's end, and on August 17th, 2013, Cole pulled off some really sick shit. Cole had clutched the 119 live on stream. A showcase and celebration of the community's progress throughout the summer of 2013 with some major route changes that demonstrated how much more optimized the game truly was. Jellyfish Caves included some small optimizations that improved the consistency of Dilemma Skip and the clip back into the caves from under the map, and some new socks were collected in downtown to help trade for a fourth Patrick spatula, which was one of many spatulas swapped in place of others throughout the run. The biggest routing change throughout the first three worlds, however, was in Gulagoon Pier. It had been entirely reworked with a new damage boost to reach the bumper boats early. Yet another sequence break by skipping to the end of the level and working in reversed order. This type of strategy had become a staple of BFBB speedruns. Another sequence break was found in Rock Bottom, which initiates the level's final challenge from the start of the level. The developers intended for the challenge to be initiated locally with a bubble bounce, but speedrunners could now activate it from afar by using the cruise bubble. This was much faster than the previous method, which was to glide across the gap as Sandy, switch to Spongebob, and do the time challenge in its intended manner. While both of these methods effectively sequence break all of rock bottom, the cruise bubble method was fast enough to justify saving the whole level for later. In its place, Spongebob's dream was completed earlier than intended by the developers. Thanks to Cole's original hub sequence breaks from 2012, it's possible to enter Spongebob's dream before unlocking the third hub area. This was the start of major hub sequence breaks becoming useful in runs, further delinearizing Battle for Bikini Bottom speedruns. Dream would be completed early due to its new set of strategies allowing it to be cleared without the cruise bubble. At this time, there existed a primitive setup for a damage boost across the Dreamscape, later coined Oil Skip by runners of future generations. Oil Skip was added to BFBB's collection of janky damage boost skips, this one saving another major shiny object purchase. Damage and momentum boosts in general had become the game's most difficult hurdles to overcome in the run. Cole's world records included some RoboSponge skip failures, along with some audible relief after landing the new method for skipping Kelp Forest in his 119. Oh, first try. And that pure boost mentioned earlier was no joke either. Aside from the major route changes and intricate setups used to achieve sub-120, the community was able to apply newfound general knowledge to smaller areas. A section toward the end of the run became designated for finishing off earlier levels, backtracking, and exploiting level design with the cruise bubble. New cruise bubble knowledge was used to speed things up in some later levels as well. Battle for Bikini Bottom was evolving from a linear, brisk walk into a sequence-broken speedrun with some hype and challenging skips. With Cole's 119 demonstrating these great strides, he decided to take an extended break from BFBB to pursue projects with other Spongebob games. Hazel bowed out as well, returning to tool-assisted work with some of her other passions and main focuses. With two of BFBB's greatest visionaries on leave, the scene died down throughout the fall of 2013. But the renaissance was far from over. Winter of 2013 to 2014. Cole's world record of 119.59 still standing since summer, with no potential challengers. It wasn't until February when Hazel finally wrapped up her current projects and aspirations, then decided to try for a 119 of her own. And after several attempts in February of 2014, she finally closed out a 119.26. Not only had Hazel achieved her own 119, she had finally reclaimed her world record after six months of silence in the BFBB community. Despite avoiding some of the more intimidating strategies from Cole's run, many of her segments had improved movement compared to that of the former world record. Hazel's emphasis on consistency also generated a new setup for oil skip, which was quite similar to the one used in present day. There's even what appears to be an attempt at manipulating Robo Patrick's spins, a strategy that wouldn't be fully realized for years to come. In many aspects, this run was a solid push forward into the future of BFBB speedruns. But this run still amounted to nothing more than a small blip in her legacy, relative to a discovery that she'd make three days later that would change the course of BFVB's history forever. Cruise boosting! Fuck yeah!
Slow. Fuck that. Cruise boots that bitch. Oh, yeah. We're going fast, baby. SpongeBob to mission control. This shit is sick. Jump you can't make. Fuck that. The world is your oyster with cruise boosting. Just ask this guy. Yeah, I had sex with some girls after I told them I knew how to cruise boost. It was pretty cool. If you want to have sex and fuck anyone you- Whoa, slow down there, eager McBeaver. We haven't even explained how the trick works or how it was even found. I'll take it from here. I'm Average Trey, here to explain the most iconic discovery in all of Battle for Bikini Bottom speedrunning. On February 24th, 2014, Hazel discovered that it's possible to input the cruise bubble and the bubble ball on the same frame. Battle for Bikini Bottom runs at 60 frames per second, so hitting these two moves on the same frame is a 1 60th of a second window. Doing this caused the cruise bubble to interrupt the bubble ball, setting its speed boost to go on indefinitely. This speed boost is what we'll refer to as a cruise boost. This interruption causes Spongebob's increased speed from bowling to be added as a constant to his total speed, causing a new force to push him regardless of whether a player is inputting a movement. With this active, Spongebob can run with his walking speed plus however fast the interrupted bowling shot was. This discovery sends the old school BFBB Skype group into frenzy. Now, as long as the bubble bowl and the cruise bubble are both unlocked, Spongebob can potentially cross more gaps, traverse levels slightly faster, and even moonwalk. But the glitch did have its limitations at first, since the initial discovery's slow speed had few useful applications. Another small development was made in March when Cole found that sliding against a wall during activation can capture more speed, but it was very inconsistent. It wouldn't be until months later when Cole would discover the fast and consistent method for cruise boosting we've all come to know. Thanks for the high octane analysis, Trevor. Now, let's take a look at something that I don't think anyone would consider average. On February 22nd, 2014, Cole posted this horrifying strategy in the BFBB Skype group. By damage boosting and performing a precise slam into this lifeguard tower, Spongebob retains his boost momentum and gets stuck. Because his vertical velocity was stopped while still being boosted, he'd then slide off the tower and float across the large body of goo. With the right damage boost angle, it's possible to land on the island previously only accessible from the end of Gulagoon Pier, the world's final zone. So Cole had effectively found a way to skip all of Gulagoon and complete the objectives in opposite order, similar to how Hazel and Nathan broke Kelp Forest in 2012. This insane discovery would be named Sponge Gliding and saved around 90 seconds in the any percent speedrun. It also obsoleted several staples of the run, such as walking under the moat, advanced sea caves platforming, and the damage boost to skip the pier. They sure were happy to ditch that one. Cruise boosting and sponge gliding being found within such a short period of time excited and reignited the Battle for Bikini Bottom community once again. Cole would demonstrate these new, mind-blowing tricks in his record achieved on March 23, 2014. With the increased cruise boost speed from sliding off of a wall, Cole could utilize the bubble bash attack to make a super jump out of a move that was horizontally motionless before. Cole's 11739 would use cruise boosting sparingly, though this was expected with the introduction of a trick this precise. Its frame-perfect timing was an intimidating concept for those who didn't understand it, making the new route far less accessible to new and experienced players alike. Cruise boosting, along with sponge gliding, would be the first of many tricks that would increase the skill gap between Cole and the other runners. This would initiate the first of many eras in Battle for Bikini Bottom's history where world record and non-world record routes looked entirely different. Due to its apparent inconsistency, cruise boosting discouraged Hazel from doing attempts for a while. She couldn't seem to capture speeds as fast as Cole's, and Cole had trouble articulating exactly what he was doing to achieve these cruise boosts based on feel and muscle memory. It seemed for a while the community would band together to focus on strat hunting while Cole alone would progress the 80% world record. Cole's natural affinity for learning new and precise strategies kept world record attempts exciting throughout the upcoming explosion of new strategies in BFBB. Many of these new strategies would utilize the cruise boost glitch, which was quickly becoming the backbone of these speedruns. On May 4th, 2014, Cole discovered a new method for cruise boosting that made SpongeBob go... Even faster! With this boost, SpongeBob can run at twice the speed he could before. Now, some levels could be cleared in half the time, and gaps twice as large could now be jumped. 
The speed of a cruise boost is determined by the speed of the bowling shot on the frame it's interrupted. So by making the bowling shot faster, Cole could trap a boost so it could double his running speed. He did this by activating a first cruise boost to make his turning speed slower, naturally keeping him face toward the flat surface. The flat surface is important because it allows for the cruise bubble to be used while moving. By sliding against the flat surface, Cole could build speed to make his bowling shot faster and interrupt it by cruise boosting. The result was a speed boost faster than ever thought possible, with greater consistency too. This method of cruise boosting is still used by all runners of Battle for Bikini Bottom to this day. Immediately, existing cruise boost segments were re-optimized and new ones began springing up. The Battle for Bikini Bottom community and fans of Cole's channel would wait patiently for a full run showcasing this breakthrough. Damn, that looks difficult. And they'd finally get it on June 6, 2014, when Cole streamed a 115.56 on his Twitch channel. Now, 117 to 115 might seem like a pretty underwhelming time save for being able to run twice as fast, but it makes sense when you take into account the new routing balance of BFBB. Cruise boosting can only be used after the completion of the first two boss fights. As we've already established, 40 spatulas are required to challenge the second boss, Robo Patrick, and unlock the cruise bubble, the titular cruise in cruise boosting. With cruise boosting, Battle for Bikini Bottom's routing possibilities were blown wide open. Only the spatulas chosen to be collected after Robo Patrick could utilize cruise boosting, and only 34 remained before it was time for the final boss. Now, instead of only considering which stages were fastest to complete in which order, time lost from collecting any spatula in the former section of the game had to be weighed against the time saved from collecting it in the latter. Essentially, nearly every spatula in the game now had two distinct times taken to obtain. The gameplay and strategies available in the latter section of the game were so distinct from the former that they almost felt like entirely different games from one another, and routes reflected that. Terms like linear and lack of freedom could no longer be used to describe Battle for Bikini Bottom speedruns. It seemed like any small strategy could throw off the balance of the entire run, causing a full reroute. And Cole's 115 demonstrated just that. It made use of cruise boosting in many new areas, with some spatulas entirely dependent on the trick being usable. For such a complex and arcane trick at the time, he executed it with grace and consistency. But Cole's next implementation was even more impressive. One frame, reaction based, triple jumps. By damage boosting into the air, SpongeBob's state is treated as grounded for one frame. On this exact frame, the player can input moves only usable while grounded, such as the Bubble Bowl, the Bubble Bash, or a jump. Unlike damage boosts such as Oil Skip, where setting up a slide across a ledge allows a larger frame window for inputting, these newly implemented mid-air moves were true frame-perfect tricks. The reactionary aspect comes from Spongebob's Hurt animation having five different variations. Cole reacted to which of the five animations appeared after taking damage, then inputted the jump within 1 60th of a second to gain that extra height and distance. Cole implemented this tech to obsolete a death warp in Jellyfish Fields and to collect a sock before sponge gliding. If the one frame input is missed, however, Cole could just try again, as missing either of these triple jump setups would just place him back on the platform where he started. It was low risk, high reward. The strategies Cole used to get his 115 further distanced himself from the rest of the runner's technical skill, showing off the fastest cruise boosts and the most technical damage boosts ever displayed in a run thus far. He even showed off a new method for getting on top of the chum bucket by rolling the sponge ball up a set of cliffs and bouncing to the buttons mounted on the side of the building. Yet another display of Cole's cutting edge gameplay and the evolution of VFPB into a more optimized speedrun. With all of the new and exciting tricks showcased in Cole's 115, many prospective runners gained interest in Battle for Bikini Bottom. But with so many intimidating and complex strategies throughout the run, many found the game inaccessible for learning. Cole therefore decided to create a tutorial video on how to achieve a fast, modern cruise boost. Not sure how successful this will be, but I'm gonna try to give a tutorial on how to do fast cruise boost. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just hold forward and then I'm gonna do a cruise boost, and after that, like as the cruise boost is happening, I'm gonna hold left and then do another cruise boost. 
and then you get, if you do it right, then you'll get fast cruise boost. What in the goddamn hell are you talking about? Many found Cole's explanation hard to follow or simply underexplained. Hazel in particular cites that she still had trouble cruise boosting even after this tutorial was published, further demotivating her from running. It seemed like Cole would continue venturing solo further down the rabbit hole of implementing advanced strategies, while members of the community, including himself, continued on the R&D side. With so many new high-pressure strategies being implemented in such a short period of time, it seemed the first renaissance of Battle for Bikini Bottom was at its peak. The community watched in awe as Cole performed ambitious maneuvers they could hardly comprehend. It was only a matter of time before the climax was reached. One moment that would encapsulate the passion and ingenuity of the 2014 community. A moment that symbolized Battle for Bikini Bottom's transition into something more than a forgotten game from the early 2000s. On July 4th, Cole completed a BFBB any percent speedrun in 115.26, a solid improvement on his first 115. But on July 10th, 2014, Cole completed his masterpiece. <laughs> I never thought I'd get a time like that. Despite a couple of major slip-ups, Cole's 112 demonstrated the most optimized spatula and sock route of its time, ordering objectives in a way no player had attempted before. This level of optimization was extremely impressive for a game entirely optimized by a small group of friends until this point. Together, Cole and the rest of the community had built a speedrun that would inspire players years after they were gone. Cole felt the 112 was the natural conclusion to his Battle for Bikini Bottom speedrunning career. Any further improvements would require serious grinding to lower the time, which he was not interested in pursuing. Without motivation from anyone else to challenge the 112, any percent speedrun activity gradually slowed to a stop. It was truly the end of an era. Despite announcing his retirement from any percent speedruns, Cole continued to search for obscure glitches in Battle for Bikini Bottom at his own leisure. Hazel began focusing 100% on tool-assisted speedrunning in BFBB as she had also long since lost interest in real-time attempts. It seemed glitch showcasing and tassing were Cole's and Hazel's respective final destinations. Despite their impactfulness on the game's world record history, they never had interest in grinding their small project competitively. Their records were a product of their passion for turning uncharted territory into a showcase of remarkable skips and glitches. Along the way, they solved many of the game's problems that held it back from reaching its potential. Once a linear collectathon, 
now an open and complex platformer. In November of 2014, Hazel would go on to create the first Battle for Bikini Bottom any percent tool assisted speedrun in 104.37 and 4 frames. With Cole's 112 speedrun and Hazel's 104 TAS, the Titans were finally satiated. Though they'd continue recording challenge and task segments for leisure, this would conclude the first renaissance of Battle for Bikini Bottom. Despite the world record progression, routing advancements, and viewer interest slowing down, the community's Skype group remained active for the next year. Much like the Robo SpongeBob skip, debug trigger skips were found for the Flying Dutchman and Prawn boss fights in August of 2015. Though Prawn skip had no use in any percent at the time, Dutchman skip was implemented soon after its discovery. Sometime in 2015, the community discovered that the Xbox version of Battle for Bikini Bottom saved a significant amount of time due to its faster loads between zones. Cole decided to complete a run on August 12th using his Xbox 360 in compatibility mode. He achieved a 109.29, breaking another 10 minute barrier in the speedrun. Though he felt it wasn't as impressive as his 112, the run still sub 110 due to the loading time advantage on the Xbox 360, as well as the new debug trigger method for defeating the Flying Dutchman. The run's transition to Xbox 360 further demotivated the community from learning and running BFBB, as most only had access to the GameCube version. Battle for Bikini Bottom was not a very competitive speedrun at the time, and its community members preferred to optimize it casually, instead of using the intimidating strategies that Cole was implementing. It seemed the difficulty of the run had outgrown the community, with its precise and arcane tricks. Realizing this, Cole began working on an any percent speedrun tutorial that would teach the community his methods for executing these tricks. He claimed that rather than fully coming out of retirement to improve the world record further, he felt completing the guide for new runners was of greater priority. Cole's tutorial video would reach the 5 spatula mark before his progress discontinued. At this time, speedrunning at large was growing rapidly due to the success of Games Done Quick and several personalities on the livestream platform, Twitch. But with the Battle for Bikini Bottom community dying down, it could not capitalize on this growth. Cole tried submitting Battle for Bikini Bottom to several Games Done Quick events, but was declined from all of them. Playing the game on a stage for thousands to see would have been the ultimate finale, going out with a bang. But unfortunately, it went out with a whimper. Battle for Bikini Bottom would once again be left behind. Despite the community's humble size and ambitions, the speedrunners of Battle for Bikini Bottom kept the game alive for several years and entertained its old-time fans along the way. Cole managed to reach 1,000 subscribers on YouTube through uploading glitch showcases, challenge runs, and world records. He celebrated this feat by returning for one final stream, during which he ran through all of his old speed games for the fans who were still around. The marathon finished with none other than Battle for Bikini Bottom any percent after which he revealed his face and bid the community farewell. I just want to have this so that later on, uh, if I watch this video, I can see how I looked, where I am and all that, yeah. So, that's about it. The or so they all thought. But what would it take to revive this obscure game a second time? What would it take to not only improve Cole's record, but to make the game progression exciting again? Did BFBB have potential to become more than just a nostalgic project, or would the passion behind it develop further and grow into something greater? All of these questions and more would soon be answered in the coming revolution during what our new protagonists would later refer to as the second renaissance of Battle for Bikini Bottom. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm SM Loader. See you all in the next phase. Subscribe and ring the bell to know when part two is available to watch.